uh, environmental sustainability initiative started with our president, Thomas Tabura. And um, it was actually at a TLMI event where he heard about Project Life and just the different um, things that were going on in the industry. And he brought it back to his team and basically said, this is what we're going to do. And, and uh, you guys are going to help me um, solve the problems that we have here. We started small. Um, you know, we had a, you know, a wide range of materials that were going to the landfill. Um, but pretty easily, you know, we identified, you know, we can recycle um, our metals. So we sp split all that up. We knew we can recycle plastic bottles. So we started small there. Um, the time consuming piece was really, you know, finding a place for um, our electronics or some of those other, um, you know, types of waste that people aren't, you know, they're not really familiar with where to take things. Um, so we really leveraged our waste management companies, the transportation companies. We even called our suppliers and said, hey, you know, you guys are sending us this stuff. We're, we're using it, but we have this waste. Can you, can you help us out? Can you find a solution? And, and some of our suppliers actually asked us to send it back to them. Had a dedicated um, um, shipping dock where we had a trailer and everything would be put into Gaylord, you know, boxes and we would wait for the truck to be filled. And then we would have pretty, um, you know, we could ship all that to the landfill, but we knew that wasn't right. Um, so we paid a, it was pretty expensive to ship all of that uh, material up to our old um, uh, recycler. And, um, but we knew it was the right thing to do. And um, the problem was we have a uh, automatic, um, we call it a waste sucker, or a waste removal system through the facility. It grinds up all the matrix waste and puts it in the dumpster. Unfortunately, that the previous company that we used couldn't take that. They had to have it in those boxes. So we, re we couldn't say we were you know, fully landfill free um, because all of that ground up matrix waste was still uh, going to the landfill. Um, just recently within the past year, um, we found another company out of uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia called Instorga, and they were then very similar to our old company, but they were actually able to take the ground up uh, matrix waste as well. So now we just, you know, throw everything in the dumpster um, and then have a separate dumpster for the ground up matrix waste that they can then take. So two pieces of advice. Uh, first, you got to have the right team. And I think uh, I'll speak for Thomas here. But, you know, he would, I think he would say the same thing. You've got to build a good team. You have to build the culture around, you know, doing the right thing for the environment. Um, you know, some, it's, it's tough to get some people on board, but you got to have that team. Um, and the second thing I would say is uh, start small. You know, it's, it's not like we in a year became landfill free. It took us, um, you know, over 10 years to uh, be able to, get to that point. We used a lot of bubble wrap. Uh, we actually estimated that we used around 200,000 feet of bubble wrap. We used it you know, for packaging the labels and protecting the labels so when they arrive at our end user, they, uh, the labels weren't damaged. One of the problems is Bubble wrap is not biodegradable. When they get it, a lot of times we found that it just ended up in the trash and we knew that, you know, that wasn't a good thing. So we got the SGP committee together. We started brainstorming. We also realized during this process that we had a lot of cardboard, a lot of unused cardboard. So one of the team members on the SGP committee found a shredder online and we went, uh, drove uh, about two hours, demoed the, the unit. It actually gives us more protection than bubble wrap. One of the things that we found from our customers was when the labels would arrive at their facility, the bubbles would have deflated. We are now able to repurpose the cardboard that, that we collect from, uh, from our suppliers. And we also now encourage our customers to use the cardboard for their packaging needs or other needs in their facility. We actually created a label uh, that we would put on the inside of the box that would say, you know, hey, please reuse this if you can. So uh, a lot of good things have come out from this, uh, from this project and from the SGP committee. 
We actually encourage our employees to bring in their big TV boxes or their Amazon boxes so we can, uh, we can shred those up here and use them as packaging material. We've seen about a 60% reduction from switching to bubble wrap to this, uh, to this cardboard. We started um, down this journey in 2010. We were part of the Project Life initiative and some of our earlier problems, you know, just as anyone would face going down and trying to be landfill free is we had to identify our options to recycle and start collecting these things and separating them into specific bins. So we did that, we, we got everything set up, but there were still some items where we were unable to find somebody to collect the material. And the main one being the pressure sensitive waste. You know, we didn't have anybody really that could take that and reuse it or, or recycle it. And so a couple years later, we, we finally did find someone, but the problem then was everything had to be in these large Gaylord boxes, uh, cardboard boxes, and it was pretty far away. So we had some pretty high transportation costs. While this got us close, we still weren't able to say we were fully landfill free because we didn't have a way of transporting our shredded pressure sensitive waste because throughout our facility at Hub Labels, we have an automatic waste removal system that gets dumped into a dumpster. And we were unable to get that shredded waste into those large Gaylord boxes. So that was a problem. So uh, fast forward a little bit to uh, June, 2019 and uh, we, found a company called Instorga in Martinsburg, West Virginia. They were able to take all of our pressure sensitive waste, shredded, it didn't have to be in the Gaylor boxes and it reduced our transportation costs. They were able to use that through, through their technology. Storga, they'll take all of our pressure sensitive waste. They also take all of our municipal waste. So anything from the offices and things. Pressure sensitive goes through one side of their process and the municipal waste goes through their other process. But the thing they really care about is our inks. Our inks, they, they don't like buckets of ink being dumped into their facility because it can stain everything and, and cause it to be pretty slippery. So one of the things that we do here is we clean all of our jugs our, our ink jugs, our ink buckets, clean everything out and then we put it into the dumpsters and then transport it down to them. That's pretty much the only thing that, you know, they really dislike other than any other hazardous waste that, you know, we don't, we don't send to them, so. We've been working on this for 10 years and for us to finally be able to say, you know, we are landfill free. That is, it's pretty huge. So definitely there's a component of employee pride that I think everyone here feels. And as far as our customers, you know, before COVID, you know, when we would bring people in for tours and things and, you know, we could show them all the things that we do and show them our environmental boards and communication boards and all the awards and things that we've won. You know, they're, they're very impressed. And, you know, just knowing that they can work with a supplier, a company like ours, is a, it's a big deal to them. We started back in the early 80s um, recycling and we had different waste streams. Uh, it, was, it was pretty um, archaic. Uh, Early on, we said that we wanted to do what was right for the environment, so we just kept pushing, trying to find avenues, uh, different resources. Um, along the way, we were just talking one day with our plate supplier, and we said, we really want to find an, av an avenue for all of our plates to be uh, recycled or reused. TR3 program, which totally takes all of the packaging, all of the scrap waste from plate material and reuses it. So we collect that on a monthly basis and send that back to uh, fuel blending. Headed up by DuPont, um, all of the corrugated goes back to DuPont and reuse. All the plate material either gets fuel blended or uh, reused also. So even 
even the slip sheets in between the plates go back and get reused also. So 100% of all the items in the plate room get uh, reused by DuPont. Early on, we had a, a group of four or five individuals that walked around our printing plant and just wrote down every, every item that was a potential waste product. Um, but the biggest item is the, the waste coming off the press. So out in our, our outside our warehouse, we have an 18 wheeler sitting out there and we're filling that with, uh, with waste every, every month, sending that down to uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And we have a Covanta plant uh, 12 miles down the road. And it's cheaper for us to send it to a, uh, a plant down in Allentown to ship it down there um, than it is to go for the tipping fees across town. So it's a matter of just networking and talking to people and finding out where the resources are. Um, but I'm going to say it's probably at least uh, 10 to 20 percent more than uh, going to going to SysTech is probably 10 to 20 percent more or maybe even more than that, than going to uh, just down the throughway to a landfill. If, you're, if you want our environment to continue the way it is, um, you wanna find and do the best thing for the environment. And at Syracuse Label, I feel that uh, we're constantly evolving, trying to find new programs. And it's not, um, we're printers, but in the end, we want to do what's right for our environment. about this for a, a long time, Roz, and uh, Art always wanted to be a, a leader in the label world and in the label industry. Uh, he had decided that when the life program had came about for TLMI, that he wanted to be a part of that, and he wanted to be an early adopter of that. So we went uh, full bore into trying to find ways to take all of our waste streams and eliminate them. Uh, starting with some of our very low hanging fruit, which is just by installing recycling cans in every workspace. And that was one of the very first things we did and was a phenomenal change for us. And it really began the change of the culture that we have of now, everything is looked for a way to not put in landfill. We did put together a cross-functional team from across the company. Uh, it was from not only production, but from the offices uh, and all of the different departments within your ASIC label. Uh, I was actually leading it at that time. Today, I am no longer leading it. Uh, it's been passed on to another one of our associates uh, with a, a different cross-functional team uh, updated to always bring new eyes into it and uh, new ideas. So uh, we've had 10 people on our team for the past 10 years. Uh, we've slimmed it down to eight now. I'm still involved with it. Uh, I oversee it. But the day-to-day -day operations is actually being ran by my son. 
one of our biggest obstacles early on was uh, with Matrix, because obviously everybody knows Matrix Waste is one of your biggest waste streams you have in your facility. And we found a company out in the eastern part of Pennsylvania that was willing to take it. They took and tested it and said, yes, it will work for our uh, needs, but they would not take it loose. So we needed to have a, a compactor put in place for it. And that in itself was about a three month investigation uh, to find a compactor that would work well enough for us. Because obviously self adhesive paper is sticky. Uh, that kind of helped us, well, it actually hurt us in trying to find a bailer that would work for us. So uh, we ended up settling with company called Zampagna and they worked with their engineers worked with us to actually develop the bailer that we have today and we have no problems with the bells going in the matrix going in the bells coming out uh, that was probably our biggest overall uh, hurdle to get by once we got by that I mean our landfill rate drastically dropped some other hurdles in it are, I mean, we had a solvent plate system. So we wanted to remove that solvent plate system out. We invested deeply and highly in new technologies uh, to remove old, outdated systems that created high waste. Um, at one point, we were, we were permitted hazmat transporter from the waste that was being hauled off, we're now conditionally exempt because we have no hazardous materials leaving our building. So those were big fines for us. They took a lot of time to get to that point. It's not like you can jump in and say, hey, I'm going to landfill free tomorrow. It's a journey and we're still on that journey. We actually worked with uh, one of our LTL carriers and they've dropped a trailer at one of our loading docks. Now we have multiple loading docks, so we have the ability to leave one not being used. Uh, so they drop a trailer. When the trailer's full, logistics will call, have them come pick it up. They'll come in, they'll drop another trailer, pick that trailer up and leave. Our customers really haven't asked a, a lot about it or commented on it but we do get questions uh when we're, we're bidding on new pieces of business and there are, there have been more and more questions on what are you doing for the environment and what are your environmental initiatives so i have seen a lot more of that in recent years uh, i think that's going to continue to grow as more and more companies are becoming more environmentally friendly they want to know that their partners are environmentally friendly and it goes down the line to our partners and our vendors uh, what are they doing so we've been asking them more and more what they're doing so we know that what we're doing is the right thing and we're passing it on to our customer in the right way We um, are predominantly now doing healthcare uh, labels for pharmaceutical and clinical trial companies. Um, and we specialize in ECL booklets. So ECL booklets have caused a little bit of uh, issue with our matrix recycling because our matrix is not just adhesive and, and purchase sensitive uh, label stock. There's leaflet material and laminate mixed in as well. So, we run a weekly, or sorry, a monthly meeting um, in which we get together and discuss all things sustainability. As I mentioned, we make expanded content labels, and so we have uh, offset leaflets that we produce. And there's a lot of clean waste material off the outside edges of that material that gets, you know, guillotined off. And uh, we started sending that to a plant for recycling years ago, um, and that was just a small chunk. Uh, 
Also the aluminum plates from offset, we started recycling those and getting those shredded up so that they can, we can get money back on those. Uh, and we started out small. We started saying, okay, what can we do low hanging fruit? We started composting uh, things from the conference, uh, from the break room. Uh, we started single stream recycling. So we've got on our dock, we've got uh, three bins that get picked up once a week for single stream recycling. And we have one bin that gets picked up for um, uh, composting. So we just thought, oh, okay, now what can we try to do? Uh, and through TLMI, I learned a lot about uh, waste to energy, which granted it's not much off of the landfill uh, in the hierarchy, but at least it's better than the landfill. Um, and we started working on ways to try to get our matrix waste to a point where we could transport it somewhere. First, we had to find some place to send it. Um, and through, again, association with TLMI, we came across Convergent Energy. Um, and I think that has been our, our, our big success is, is the matrix recycling. Right now, we're, with all the things that we're doing, we're at about 85% landfill free, which is, which is um, feeling very good, but we still have a long way to go. But in terms of the cost, uh, it started out being a, a little bit more expensive than going to landfill, but then we've found ways to, to make that more economical and it's actually um, saving us a little bit of money now. So uh, it, let's just call it break even. You have space on your floor for things that make money. One of the obstacles is how do you sell, we're gonna collect our waste and, and, and save it for a month and ship it off to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Some of they all say, well, how is that going to be economical? Well, we found a space that was less expensive, that was bigger. The space also we use for um, uh, storage of, of product that needs to be kept for long term, that needs um, uh, climate control. Um, but we found the space uh, a little further across town, unfortunately, as opposed to um, one and a half miles down the road, it's six and a half miles away. Um, but it was less expensive per month and uh, it was gonna work out, work out great. So that was obstacle one. Obstacle two was um, we felt it was important, even though some of our, our other uh, colleagues within TLMI have, have made it work just using Gaylords for collection of their, their matrix, we decided we needed to bail them. So we were in search, while we're looking for the building, we were also in search for a bailer. So we found a used baler that we got recon, um, refurbished to be able to handle the pressures that were going to be exerted with doing these bales of matrix. And uh, we bought that. Fill Gaylords on our plant floor. We have to then move them across into the other building. Um, so we had to set aside space that was normally meant for raw materials and, and things that make money and put things that weren't making money, but the things that were the right things to do that it's worth it in the end. Um, you may not do everything right. You're, it's gonna cost some money. Um, but if you wanna do it, you just have to do it. And sometimes it's managing up, you know, the people on the floor saying, this seems, you know, crazy for us to be throwing all this stuff away when it could be recycled or it could be going to waste energy. Um, and then of course you do have um, inspired people above that say, hey, uh, you know, let's do that waste reduction exercise and, you know, set aside that part of your plant floor for everything that's going in the dumpster. Um, instead of diving into the dumpster, just put it someplace for a couple of days where everybody can just see what it is and say, oh, that can go there or that can go there. It takes a commitment on many levels within an organization to start the journey towards becoming landfill free. Welcome to A Glimpse Into Ours. Here at CCL Label St. Louis, we have started the journey. You are watching a time-lapsed video of the trek from our main building to our rented annex space across town, where we bail and collect the matrix byproducts from our production. The drive across town is just the daily part of our journey. It has been a long road getting to this stage. Back at the main plant, instead of using solid fiber cores for winding up our matrix, we utilize expandable silicone netting sleeves. 
Once the matrix roll is complete, we remove the sleeve from the center of the matrix in order for it to be coreless. Matrix is collected in Gaylords on the plant floor. We transport full Gaylords to the Annex building where we bale, weigh, and collect 20 plus tons of material in order to fill a truckload. Having coreless matrix makes it possible to compress the rolls more effectively during baling so that we can increase the poundage per bale. Once a truckload is collected, we schedule the load to be picked up by a transport company that utilizes a truck that would normally be going back empty. The cost-effective, cleaner burning fuel pellets produced by Convergent Energy can be utilized wholly or be blended in with other fuels at steam, boiler, power generation facilities around the region. At Convergent, our matrix is mixed with the byproducts from other companies from around the country. The materials are ground together using specialized shredding equipment and then compressed into fuel pellets. At CCL Label St. Louis, we are endeavoring to be as green as possible and to expand our sustainability program by encouraging composting, single stream, recycling in the break room, recycling of paper from our offset presses, as well as cardboard, liner, and converting them uh, to LED overhead lighting are a few of the other projects that we've incorporated along the path. The journey has not been easy or without obstacles, nor are we at the destination yet. We do have a pride in having persevered along the journey to get where we are today. And we are continually looking to improve the process along the way. We are an older organization, go back to the 1800s, uh, fourth generation, always proud of that. And we've had a long history of environmentalism, sustainability of the business, you know, doing the right things. So we, we've always recycled to some level uh, and moved our waste streams into their best places. But even at that, we didn't, we weren't doing everything we could. Uh, and, and it wasn't until 2012 meeting with family members, we had a family meeting. We asked them the question, what would you like to see from this business going forward? Because as, as parents, all of us, moms and dads, uh, we're speaking for our kids who are gonna be the next generation of this business, the fifth generation. What would you like to see from the business? And overwhelmingly, our spouses uh, responded to us that nothing's gonna be more important to the fifth generation than, than sustainability and environmentalism. But you've gotta get into your waste streams and determine what you have because I think that's going to play out later. Okay, where can you take it? Who are your suppliers that can handle it? But you've got to understand your waste streams. And, and what we found was about 50% of our waste was matrix. All right, let's keep going of that matrix. What is that made of? Because people are going to want to know downstream. Is it polyester? Is it polypropylene? Is it paper? Is it vinyl? Is it, you know, what is it? We just ironically, we were about a third, a third, a third polyester based materials, polypropylene based, paper based. Um, so we gathered all that information. It really didn't take all that long. And we still use that data today. And, I, and we'll, every once in a while, we'll go out and double check it. And it stays pretty consistent, right? We have long term relationships with our customers. We get some slight changes, but it's been pretty, pretty good at predicting what our waste streams are going to be. So now you know roughly how much of these recyclable materials you have, how much of the matrix you have. Um, so what are you gonna do with it? And another piece of advice, does it work really well for us? Now it's just happenstance at the time, but we, we found a college group of seniors that were working on a senior project and they needed a project to work on. And uh, we connected with them through some networking and they took on this project of helping us find recycling outlets. And so I'd always recommend 
talking to the local colleges. I mean, there's a it's a it's a need on their part, right, to do the projects and they learn a ton, and it's a need on our part. And even if, if we have to sponsor it and pay for it, that's well worth worth the dollar. I had heard over and over again, I think I could still hear it in certain circles today that you have to bail to be able to uh, get your matrix out of your facility. And and we we thought that, right? And that became a, a a large obstacle. So we, we worked on all the recycling and then we was like, okay, we gotta work on the matrix. It's 50% of our ways, we've got to figure it out. But we know we need to buy a baler, we got to figure out space for a baler, we have to make capital expense uh, to do it properly. We need a you know it's got to be horizontal, we've got to have a conveyance system. It's very complicated. Everyone says it's going to cost more. I think most of the people who are doing it now will tell you it actually costs less to uh, divert your waste from the landfill. You have to look at your bill, uh, your landfill bill. Your local uh, carrier will tell you, or hauler will tell you that it's $30 a ton, $35 a ton, something like that. But when all the expenses are added up, I've not heard anyone disagree with this much. Like our average bill is $85 a ton uh, through our landfill hauler. That's pretty common. And, and it varies by region of the country. It can be more, it can be a little bit less, but it's a significant amount. And then when you when you figure out how to divert it from the landfill, you're gonna find shipping's gonna be one of your more expensive things, right? Hiring a truck to send it somewhere might cost you $500 or even $1,000, which is a lot of money. $1,000, 20 tons, that's $50 a ton. Well, I'm already spending $85 a ton to go to the landfill. Now I'm spending $50 a ton to move the waste to a waste to energy facility. If I can, if they'll take it and tip it for $30 or less, then I'm still good. And if my gala is only costs $5 a ton or less, then I'm under my 85. And that's where we're at. We're, we're cost neutral or making a little bit of money compared to that. So that's, that's another huge hurdle. Okay, here we are getting the truck loaded. As I mentioned, we send out one to two trucks a month for waste energy, where we take our waste material and we turn it into these pellets. These pellets then get used to fire up a coal burning plant, power plant, and we get to replace the coal. This journey has taken us six steps to get there, and what we're gonna show you next are, is the process of how we got to this point where we can ship out one to two trucks a month. In our recycling center here, right down at the end, we have metal, then we have wood, then we have mixed paper, or here corrugated, a lot of corrugated, hard plastic and soft plastic. Those are the main categories for recycling. And then we also, being a label company, about 50% of our waste is matrix. So we, we have these matrix rolls that come off the end of our press. We also analyze these because we wanted to know what was in them, what type of material. And about a third of our matrix waste is polyester. About a third of it is polypropylene. And about a third of it was paper. And it just worked out for them. We're here to tell you every single one of them could be accomplished. So what we do here is we gather our product off the end of the press like this. And a lot of people gather it, you know, through a air handling system. That's great. And they bail it even better. We did not have those systems in place here. So we gather this way off press and we have these types of galers throughout our facility. And press operators go and put it in a matrix galer. If you go to our website, in the environmental section, there is a scorecard that we publish that we share with our, our clients, we share with our suppliers, we share with anybody who wants to see it, to see just how we're doing it.